So, wir fahren jetzt fort mit der Nachmittagssession. Wir sind ganz pünktlich in der Zeit. Bevor, wir, bevor ich jetzt den ersten Redner am Nachmittag vorstelle, möchte ich mich ganz herzlich für die Einladung von Sport Physio bedanken und für die ausgezeichnete Zusammenarbeit über die letzten Jahre. Gratulation für die wirklich tolle Veranstaltung. Ich bin jetzt zum vierten oder fünften Mal hier und es wird eigentlich von jedes Jahr noch besser. Und äh, Stefan hat ja erwähnt, dass das eine Art Beginn sein soll für die Zusammenarbeit zwischen den drei Verbänden von Schweiz, Österreich und Deutschland, dass zumindest jedes Jahr eine sportphysische Veranstaltung in Mitteleuropa stattfindet. Dieses Jahr ist es die Schweiz. Nächstes Jahr sind wir in Österreich dran. Und zwar wird in Salzburg am 2. und 3. Oktober 2015 unser Symposium stattfinden mit dem Thema Sensormotor Control and Training. Das Besondere dieser Zusammenarbeit soll auch sein, dass die jeweiligen Mitglieder, zum Beispiel von Sport Physio in der Schweiz, in Österreich auch den vergünstigten Eintrittspreis erhalten. Also das soll nebenbei noch, neben der Zusammenarbeit noch stattfinden, dass eben der Preis vergünstigt ist. Ja, und bevor ich jetzt noch weitermache, genau, ich muss noch eine kurze Anmerkung machen, danke, dass Sie uns den Marcel Koll überlassen habt und auch eine Form von guter Zusammenarbeit und Jetzt kann ich aber fortfahren. Ich möchte den Nicola Mafioletti vorstellen. Uh, Nicola ist a Senior Researcher and Laboratory Director at the Neuromuscular Research Laboratory at the Schultes Klinik in Zürich. And since 2001, he's an Assistant Professor, Postgraduate Teaching Assistant and Research Associate at the Faculty of Sport Sciences at the University of Dijon in France. He has published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers and is one of the most famous world leaders in neuromuscular research. And he's at his first appearance with his new beard. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Yes, I look older. Um, thank you very much to Sport Physio. Merci, danke, grazie. I'm very happy to be here, as usual. This year, I have a little bit more pressure because of the speaker preceding uh, and following my talk. But I will be very happy to start from uh, where Peter McNair uh, already introduced the problem. So I will have just to go back to that. So to what we call inhibition, I will say a few words about atrophy. I will try to reintroduce a little bit the problem. And then I will try to give you some potential ideas that are not comprehensive. This is something that I acknowledge. So you have to take that into a puzzle together with the other things you have uh, listened to this morning. So actually, what do we know? Which is actually part of the title of my talk. Uh, we know very well that uh, if we test patients who had uh, had knee surgery, all kind of knee surgery, but I would also have to say people before surgery, uh, what we consistently find is uh, the following result. So this is force, this could be power, this could be torque, this could be quad whatever indicator of muscle function. What we systematically observe is a deficit in muscle function. The deficit can be as high as 50, 60 percent a few days after surgery. This could be also very high with pain. But the problem for me is that the deficit exists before surgery, and that's usually around this range. This 20 percent is a magic number that unfortunately we also find at six months after surgery and at six years after surgery, probably also at 60 years after surgery. That's unfortunately a deficit that we keep almost forever. What we know is that part of this deficit is due to muscular problems, and uh, we already spoke about atrophy a little bit this morning. There is not a lot about uh, qualitative changes, changes in the contractile capability of muscles, but I love very much this study because uh, this makes really a very clear message. So these are ACL patients, uh, 9 to 11 years after ACL reconstruction with a hamstring graft. And what you see here, this is the volume of the gracilis muscle. So this is the good side, this is the operated side. And of the semitend muscle, uh, good, 
operated site. So 9 to 11 years after surgery, the muscle volume of this muscle on the operated site, using the graft, which is from the hamstring, is still 40 to 45 percent less. So there is a huge muscle atrophy. Together with that, I'm not here to speak about hamstring, but uh, I mean, this is because surgery has been done with a hamstring graft. When it is done with a quad graft, uh, we don't have uh, so much atrophy in the quad. But for example, these people, 11 years after surgery, ACL reconstruction, they still had a deficit in the quad muscle mass of 10%, which is huge. But I'm not here to speak about atrophy. I'm here to speak about what we call inhibition, what we call deficit of activation problem in activating muscles. I don't go into the details, but I mean, this is only one of the potential problems we can have in terms of neural control of muscles. For example, an increased coactivation of the hamstrings when we do this kind of movement is also a problem. I will stick, as Peter already said, on the inhibition originally introduced in the 60s with these studies, and today more likely represented with this approach, which is nothing but twitch interpolation. We stimulate muscle at the maximum, Peter already did a great job. Uh, we expect to be at the maximum. We are only at 80%, so we have a 20% deficit in inhibition. And that's also a magic number here, the 20%, because we found a deficit usually of 20% in people before and after, after knee surgery. Uh, and I also have a magic formula that's uh, a simplification. Uh, thanks to this paper, so JBJS 2005, that's a that's Niedermachler group. Uh, actually, by doing a, this kind of predictor analysis, they were able to show that, at least for total knee arthroplasty, but uh, I would bet everything that it is also true for patients with meniscectomy, ACL, cartilage reconstruction, the contribution to muscle weakness is uh, accounted for by two-thirds by a deficit in activation and by one-third in a deficit in muscle atrophy. So I'm tempting to tell you that 66% uh, of the weakness you typically get in patients, patients with knee surgery is due to neural inhibition. One third is, is due to atrophy. And I'm also here to tell you that uh, I share very much this uh, vision, which is uh, a review paper done by Ryan Pal Palmieri-Smith, telling that actually muscle weakness and muscle atrophy are simply consequences of the deficit in inhibition. So you have a deficit in inhibition, which will bring you to activate less muscle, to be weaker, to develop muscle atrophy, especially in those muscle fibers who are never contracted, because the, we have this 20% deficit or more. This atrophy will bring about functional alterations. Those functional alterations will bring about increased joint loading, and in turn, it will probably uh, develop into uh, knee OA. Actually, I, lo I love this model, and I think the model can be applied also to the hip. So we do have some data from uh, impingement, so FAI patients, uh, which suggest more or less the same approach. So there is inhibition in hip muscle, especially in hip flexor for impingement patient, and this will bring about all those consequences. That's why it will bring about also um, hip osteoarthritis. And there are also some recent advancement in hamstring tears, uh, with a new hypothesis saying, suggesting that hamstring tears very often occurs because, because, one more time, of inhibition of muscles. So I'm trying really to stress this neural component. And I'm really trying to tell you that um, this inhibition is actually a good message for you as a therapist. So I'm not a physical therapist. <laughs> no, that's a long story. Uh, uh, but I think this is the best message I can tell you. So the problem is not the muscle. Again, the problem is not muscle atrophy, for which it would be very difficult to rebuild muscle mass. And you as a therapist, probably you will have tons of problems with uh, other contributors to atrophy, especially nutrition. I'm telling you that the problem here is inhibition. So it's how you contract your muscle, which is a great message for you because we have a ton of possible strategies, stratagem, that can be used to remove, at least in part, inhibition. Uh, and just to show you that, so I collected tons of data from basically all the studies in which uh, uh, inhibition has been quantified. These are total knee, because there are more data, more valid data for me. And uh, these are inhibition data, so from 0 to 35 along this axis. 5 is the minimum, so it's the normal activation or the normal inhibition of people with no impairments. 
These are the pathological data. As I told you, the 20% is the magic number. Uh, actually, here you see different things along time, pre-op, one, three, six months after total knee and one year after total knee. You see, number one, that the deficit is bilateral, as Peter already mentioned, which confirms also this central component of inhibition. The deficit is preoperative, as you can see here. So red is the operated side, uh, gray is the non-operated side. The deficit is a longer-term deficit, so I stopped here at 12 months because I have uh, large numbers until here, but there are studies up to 33 months after surgery. And I will say, if you test them even 10 years after surgery, you should get this 20% as well. And what I like very much from this analysis, if, if you focus at one month, look what happens. So pre-op, they have the same inhibition on the operated red and non-operated gray side. For a month, one side is immobilized almost, so the red. So you have an increase in inhibition, which makes sense to me. And the other side is taking over a little bit the effect of the immobilized side. So the contralateral side, the non-operated one, is doing a little bit more than usual. And what you see here is that the inhibition goes down dramatically. And you had a huge difference between the two legs. But afterward, as soon as people start to move with the two legs, inhibition comes up again on the non-operated side. And then it is very high. So anyway, let's stick to one month. For me, this is the message. So inhibition is a plastic, adaptable phenomenon. And that should be your focus. And the message here, it is indeed very plastic. One month without special therapy on the non-operated side. And inhibition goes down. And here I'm not speaking about a study with 10 people, I'm studying about 20 studies. So I think at one month here, there, has, there are at least 200 total knee arthroplasty patients from Europe, US, Australia. So for me, it's pretty convincing. And if I continue what Peter told you this morning with the peripheral approaches, I'm here to speak about the central approaches. Because the more I do this job, and the, the more I believe there is something that is uh, neglected, both in training and in rehab. And that's the case, for example, also for, in particular, for inhibition. And I would say, let's stick to accessible, low-cost strategies with neural effects. They come from neurological PT, so probably you already know many of these approaches. But they also come from strength conditioning, which is a little bit more my background. Uh, they can be used before and after surgery. And what I simply am here to do today is I, I will try to suggest that in addition to the peripheral approaches you have seen this morning, in addition to the tons of possibilities you have, which you can extract from the talks of this morning, from the talks of this afternoon, you could maybe focus also a little bit more on the central nervous system and more likely on the cortical contribution with those three approaches that I will detail afterward. So contralateral training, mental practice, electrical steam, and I will tell you two words about that, eccentric ballistic contractions, always combined with, whenever possible, with biofeedback, because I guess biofeedback is the most essential part, favoring this uh, sensory feedback, improving the performance of what we conduct. And now, for each of those five uh, strategies, I will try, so I have three slides per strategy, and with the three slides, I will try to tell you how it works, maybe you know already. I will give you the evidence, because I think it's important to provide some evidence, not simply suggesting something. And I will try to provide you some practice, so how you should implement it if you want to do that. Contralateral contractions. Uh, this is based on what we call cross-education uh, in, uh, in exercise physiology. Cross-education is nothing but you train one side and you get an improvement on one side, on a specific muscle, whatever muscle of the body, you improve, let's say, by 20% the performance after four to six weeks of training on one side, but you also get a cross-education effect, so which means on the contralateral, non-trained side, for the same muscle group, you also get an improvement, which is usually 50% compared to the trained side. So if you gain 20, you gain 10 on the non-trained side. And we know, and the amazing thing is that uh, it is true for all kinds of contractions isometric, concentric, eccentric, even stimulation. So if you stimulate a patient on one side and you get an improvement of 10%, you get 5% on the other side, just because of neural adaptations. And there is a paper which has been published uh, last week on vibration. So if you do 
whole body vibration on one side and you train and you get an improvement on the vibrated side, you also get an improvement on the non-vibrated side. And that's very fascinating. The concept behind that is that uh, the phenomenon is what we call motor irradiation. So whenever there is uh, this uh, central drive going down to the spinal cord and to the muscle fiber on one side of your brain, there is also an improved interhemispheric excitability, so a transfer of some electricity, let's uh, say it very simple, to the contralateral cortex, which will bring about uh, some central changes, more likely cortical changes. So the changes in strength on the contralateral side are essentially due to an improved cortical excitability. This is the evidence. If you don't believe me, this is a meta-analysis, so published in one of the best journals on applied physiology, where you have basically the improvement in different studies with different muscles, with different modalities of training. Uh, on the trained side, which is close to 20%, and on the non-trained contralateral side, which is close to 10%. So the evidence is pretty, is pretty clear. And the practice is probably, this is the best paper uh, describing that. So cross ex exercise on quad deficit after ACL reconstruction. So those uh, Greek researchers and orthopedic surgeons started a week after ACL reconstruction to train for two months. The contralateral side, so they used a very simple approach, isotonic training on a leg extension machine. They used 80% of the 1RM, so I'm speaking about the side that is not operated. Uh, they were seated on the leg extension, five sets by six, uh, repetitions, a conventional rest period between the two, a progressive increase in the load because uh, in two months we increase the strength, and a traditional physical therapy in addition to that. This is the group doing the conventional physical activity, physical therapy, sorry. This is quad weakness pre-op and two months post-op. So 25%, 57%, which is what you see usually. These are two groups doing uh, three or five days a week this kind of contralateral training. And you see very well, not before, but after surgery, that the weakness you get when you do contralateral training is reduced in those two groups with no difference between three to four, five days a week. So that's pretty convincing to me. Mental practice and mental practice. I remember last year, one of the student presentation was about that and the effect of mental practice in physical therapy. That's a very fascinating field, but also very complex. When you look at the stroke patients, for example, you have many modalities. So here, the two modalities I would like to focus on are simply motor imagery, which is uh, what I call imagined strength training. So you need to imagine high intensity contraction exactly as when you do strength training, sets, repetitions, and you imagine actually maxim maximal contraction. On the other side, this uh, theory is a little bit uh, more intriguing. Uh, I like it for many reasons. And it is essentially based on a theory that you probably know, which is called the mirror neuron system. Uh, basically, in the 80s, one uh, very famous Italian physiologist, so Giacomo Rizzolatti, came up with a simple study in a macaque in monkeys, and he recorded single-cell neurons in monkeys during execution of a movement. And then he recorded the same uh, neurons while the monkeys were observing other monkeys doing the same movement. And actually, exactly the same neurons were active during observation of an action. And then the theory has been proved. It has been translated to human without recording single-cell single neurons, unfortunately, but with fMRI it works pretty well. And today we know that whenever we observe somebody doing something, and the typical example is yawning, <laughs> so when you yawn, that's the typical activation of the mirror neuron system. But also when you observe somebody doing strength training and uh, you imagine or not doing the same, the neural substrates and the cortical area active during that movement are exactly the same when you watch or when you do the movement. There is no motor component, there is no contraction, no actual contraction. Uh, that's pretty, pretty smart and pretty intriguing. But as you maybe know, in orthopedics, for example, up to today, there is one study on action observation. You give a DVD to orthopedic patients at home, they have to watch people doing exercise for the hip. And that works better than doing the typical, the conventional physical therapy. That's the evidence. So, and that's the evidence for mental practice. You can see here, so a much uh, stronger effect 
for the treatment, mental practice compared to any other form of, of, uh, of therapy. And I'm sorry, again, this is Lancet Neurology, so that's pretty high evidence. And this is the only study in ACL reconstruction patients. So that's from uh, France, that's from a guy who works today in Dijon, who's very nice, who did a study in ACL patients, and uh, seven days after reconstruction of the ACL, they started for about a month, three times a week, for only 15 minutes a session, so it's pretty short. They asked the people to be seated in this position, the quad was relaxed, and they used EMG to verify that people were not contracting. And they asked people to imagine 10 seconds contraction, maximal contraction. People had to, had to close their eyes and imagine doing a maximal extension for 10 seconds without contracting at all the muscles. So this was done again uh, with a, a normal rest period, as when we do conventional strength training. This was in addition to the traditional physical therapy. These are the results in terms of EMG, so in terms of activation of the vastus medialis for the first and the last session after the month here for the conventional group and for the group with motor imagery. And you see there is a significant difference with a much higher activation, so less inhibition due to imagined contraction, which can be done whenever, wherever, very easily with no big cost. Um, on the other side, let's uh, say a couple of words about electrical steam because uh, there is a potential, actually. The potential on one side for me is uh, to look at two recent advancements in the field. So last 10 years, there have been two revolutions for me for electrical steam. Number one is this concept of distributed current in a more physiological way, and I call it multipath. So instead of having s always the same current as you have you con with conventional systems, this is more intelligent, simply, and that's the case that's demonstrated. On the other side, a Canadian person called Dave Collins one day tried to say, OK, why don't we stimulate a muscle with wider, larger pulses, long pulses, one millisecond instead of uh, 50 or 200 microseconds. And that's what happens when you stimulate, uh, for example, this is a my flexor carpi. When you stimulate with wide pulse current, so one millisecond pulse, it's a very large pulse. This is what happens with the conventional current. You have a lot of fatigue and you have this peripheral contribution, essentially. When you stimulate with white pulse, what we know is that uh, the shaded area is simply due to the spinal contribution of reflexes. So you evoke the so-called H reflex or the spinal reflex uh, continuously with this kind of current and you maximize the spinal response of electrical steam. And that's very intriguing because it's the case also in a, uh, they demonstrated it is also the case in spinal cord injured patients and today it starts to be used as a training therapy, therapeutic modality. And then, if you are interested in the central effects of electrical steam, you can uh, give a look at this review that we wrote about the huge cortical contribution. W this has also been demonstrated with fMRI, with a dose response, do which means the more you increase the intensity of the current, the more you activate your brain in addition to the muscle. And with a huge spinal reflex activity, as uh, demonstrated here. That's the evidence. So these are healthy people, different studies. Uh, with a group doing a voluntary exercise, a group doing electrical steam. And uh, for healthy people, no more effects of electrical steam as compared to voluntary exercise. In other words, voluntary exercise is more effective to improve strength. However, in patients, both after immobilization and during immobilization, electrical steam in four out of five randomized control trial is more effective than voluntary exercise. So there is a potential. And the potential has been confirmed in this uh, randomized control trial made in Germany by the group of uh, Pessler. Uh, so basically, they adopted the multipath technology. So sorry if I go back. They compared this technology to this technology and to a third group doing conventional physical therapy. They did it uh, immediately three, four days after the operation with three sessions a day. So that's a lot. These are the frequency and the steam parameters. They asked people to co-contract the quad, and these are the results in terms of strength, but the same results were true for single hop, return to work, and many other subjective data. So pre-op, six weeks, 12, 26. Uh, look at these bars. So that's the group using the new stimulation modality, and they recovered faster, and they had less asymmetry, so more, less inhibition, sorry, after the end of training. This is the conventional stimulation group. This is the conventional therapy group. So a good potential also confirmed in this study by S Jennifer Stevens Lap Lapsley in Total Knee, where they measured activation. They found uh, uh, a better reduction 
in inhibition, if you prefer, in total knee, immediately after surgery, but not on a longer term basis in this group of patients. Eccentric contractions, and then I'm almost done, and I hope I will respect the timing. Uh, I will also stick to the, to the recent uh, advancements, which are for me on one side the equipment, but you do not necessarily need a very complex e equipment to control what you do. That's clearly more important, the dosing. So eccentric training has always been scary for whoever because of the problems of muscle damage we can induce. Today we know that we can control for that and we can avoid completely muscle damage even in patients with a lot of weakness. And the important thing for me of, uh, for eccentric exercise is that people think it's very peripheral because it's very effective to induce atrophy, hypertrophy, sorry. But people neglect those two wonderful studies, so brain research, 2004 and 2006, by the same group for submaximal eccentric and maximal eccentric. They had, uh, so that's an EEG map, that's a nose, just to tell you the direction of the cortex, and the blue and the red line are eccentric concentric conditions. And the uh, very important results are the difficulty is more difficult, so it takes more time and there is a longer preparation time for the eccentric contraction because it is difficult to do. There is a higher activity during the contraction and there is a more dispersed, dispersed activation included on the contralateral side. I didn't tell you before, but probably the way of training which is more effective for contralateral is eccentric, together with stimulation. That's the evidence, so meta-analysis saying that eccentric is more effective than concentric to induce muscle strength and also to induce muscle hypertrophy. And these are the this is the practice. So these are weeks. This is how you can dose. So this is simply RP. You don't need to measure maximal eccentric force, never. And this is how it works. Two weeks with only two, three sessions a week of five minutes so that you familiarize yourself to lengthening contractions, which are a little bit challenging. But by doing that, you will never create muscle damage. And then you are free to increase uh, both the volume and the intensity of the contractions. And there are two beautiful studies, total neutroplasty, ACL patients, made by Paul Esteo, JBJS, CORE, showing that it is very effective even 10 years after surgery. And that's my last one. Uh, ballistic training, for which I don't have a lot of evidence. That's more something that comes from the the practice in strength conditioning. Actually, that's the most effective modality for me to change the properties of the motor, motor units. If you want to increase the discharge frequency of the motor units, we know very well that doing uh, as fast as possible contractions without any kind of maintain of force, which means you only have to contract quickly and then you relax, nothing else. 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. The idea is contract as quick as you can and then relax, no fatigue, huge effects in terms of motor unit um, discharge frequency and extremely functional. The so-called rate of force development today has become one of the more functional variables because whenever you have a perturbation, both in daily life for an elderly and both in sport, uh, you need to contract as quickly as possible for a very short time. You don't need to create an MVC for five seconds, which is very artificial. Anyway, to sum up, you should consider giving priority to the treatment of inhibition both before and after surgery with what I call a cocktail. So each single approach for me doesn't make any sense. If you mix them up as you want, uh, it will be extremely effective. Neurally oriented, light, low cost, accessible, home and daily usable strategies. And I will finish with this, but I know I don't prefer not to develop. You also have many stratagems that you can use during each single session to push your patients at the maximum level and to remove inhibition. One single example, very simple, maybe not very ethics, but swearing. The effect of swearing, so saying a bad word in German or in Italian or in French, I have many examples, <laughs> uh, removes all kind of pain. There are tons of paper on the analgesic effect of swearing. By swearing, you can go farther. You can uh, resist more to the pain, and uh, the three or four papers I cite in the title, it is called Pain Killer as a Swearing uh, Strategy, and that's pretty effective. That's only one possibility. There are tons of other possibilities. Thank you very much. Sorry for, for being a little bit long. Thank you, Nicola, for these excellent presentations. presentation. Are there any questions?